Okay, welcome. Um, and thank you for attending the Larry Children's Community Provider Symposium. Uh, my name is Chad Worley, and I'm one of your co-hosts, along with Paula Nowak, who is the manager of physician services, and uh, she serves um, as a liaison to community providers in the city, near west and south regions of Chicago. Julie Kalkbrenner, one of our physician liaisons who serves the west and northwest suburban region. And like I said, my name is Chad Worley, and I serve the north side of the city and north suburban regions. The Community Provider Symposium is cre created for all of you, our community providers, along with the, your practice managers and referral coordinators. Um, engagement is really encouraged today. We know a lot of you have questions with some of the um, information we're about to share. So please submit your questions, um, and they can be in the Q&A and chat room as the presentations are going on. Or after the presentation, uh, feel free to hit the raise your hand button and, um, and we can ask a live, uh, uh, live question after the presentation. So we have a full agenda for you today. So we have Dr. Samir Patel, who uh, will be giving an infectious disease update. We'll be talking about the cold flu and RSV season and what to expect. Then we're going to have uh, Dr. Ravi Patel, the VP of Digital Health for Larry Children's, along with CJ Lilly, the Director of Digital Health. They're going to be talking about the great progress they have made with MyChart open scheduling. And then your liaison team will be talking about our new programs and services and our outpatient centers, lots of exciting news. Um, and then, of course, we have um, some information to share about new Larry Children's specialists. And then when it's all done, uh, we'd like to uh, encourage you to stay on and chat with us um, with any questions you may have uh, regarding <clears throat> your children's. So, but without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Dr. Samir Patel. Um, Dr. Patel, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I know a lot's going on um, with the cold and flu season. And I know last year, a lot of people were hit with the trifecta of both flu, RSV, and COVID. So I am sure our pediatricians who are overwhelmed this year would love to hear what you have to say. So thank you for joining us. And I'll go ahead and move the slide for you when you are uh, you want me to. All right, thank you for the opportunity. I uh, hope I can provide some uh, um, important information as we enter the season. Thank you. Next slide. Yes. So, um, so some updates um, with regarding influenza vaccine. So now the recommendation from the CDC regarding uh, starting in 2024 20, for influenza vaccine is that <clears throat> there no longer needs to be a consideration for ag allergy in those who receive influenza vaccine. So um, um, whether, regardless of the, the nature of the allergy, um, unless you are allergic to a specific component of the vaccine that's known, um, um, the allergy, egg allergy history is not relevant. Uh, and this was based on studies they did on the, the risk of adverse events from people with reported egg allergies. So just to reiterate, no additional safety measures are, are needed um, with regarding egg allergy. <clears throat> just a, a, a review of the treatment options that we have available for influenza. Um, there are two main classes of antivirals that are available, and the preferred regimen uh, the preferred regimen is oral oseltamivir, which can be given um, at any age for treatment. Uh, but for prophylaxis, we usually don't do it under three months unless certain situations. And for certain patients, we do have zanamivir, um, which um, does have a risk of bronchospasm, so it should not be given with children who have an a history of asthma or or uh, other uh, respiratory uh, conditions. Um, our other options, paramivir also in the same class as oseltamivir and um, zanamivir is um, an intravenous version, which we give to very ill children. And oral biloxivir, which <clears throat> can be given five years and older, is a different cl antiviral class, um, which, um, you know, is, uh, is a treatment option in some situations. So if I'm sure all of us um, have PTSD from last respiratory season last year of how much RSV we had, 
as you, you can see in the very tall peak uh, in the graph. Um, uh, this is uh, CDC data um, from the National Respiratory and Enteric Virus Surveillance System, um, which shows um, that our RSV PCR detections and um, antigen detections are climbing now um, yeah, since October. And this is also reiterated by our Lurie data. So we expect that this season for RSV um, is going to time out like the way it used to be before the COVID pandemic and when we had masking. So we're planning uh, in our RSV season, we're expecting one, you know, um, in, a, in a similar pattern where we really are beginning to see numbers climb now and with the peak in December and, and January. What's very exciting for this year is that there are um, two new medications for RSV prophylaxis. So Synergis, we knew we've had for more than 20 years, um, which is a monoclonal antibody with 30-day protection, which give, typically given as five, day, five doses throughout RSV season for high-risk children. Um, Nercivimab was um, FDA approved in July of this year, um, and it is a long-acting monoclonal antibody, which um, um, uh, is, uh, is available to high-risk children and also all infants under eight months. Uh, and then for pregnant women, um, there's a, a RSV vaccine, um, which uh, can uh, prevent disease uh, in their infants. So our original plan for the rollout of nirsevimab, which we spent um, some time to do so, um, was to um, uh, in encourage uh, nirsevimab administration to all babies under eight months um, in both outpatient settings and in our neonatal intensive care unit uh, discharges, unless the mother had received maternal uh, RSV vaccine, which wouldn't be relevant now since the vaccine was just approved, but later on in the season. Um, and that to, um, to um, um, and, and the, the dose is 50 milligrams for under five kilograms and 100 milligrams for over five kilograms. And, and then for, so this is essentially like a universal recommendation um, for all infants under eight months, regardless of their medical condition. And for eight to 19 months, there was a, a recommendation for certain high-risk patients for nirsevimab, which are those who have chronic lung disease of prematurity, immunocompromised patients, certain certain patients with cystic fibrosis and Native American uh, infants. Um, and um, and then for 20 to 24 months, you would still qualify for synergist, although not so although not nirsevimab, and you would, if you're high risk, you would still get pelvizumab. <clears throat> Unfortunately, as you're all aware, there is a acute shortage of nirsevimab in the United States. Um, the CDC sent out a health advisory just this week um, talking about these limited supplies. We've been in contact with the company um, and our wholesale providers um, sellers, uh, pharmacy wholesale sellers, over the last couple of weeks, and the, the shortage is very, very serious, particularly for the 100 milligram doses for the so for babies over five kilograms. Um, and um, although we expect some um, improvement in the 50 milligram doses, um, the 100 milligram doses uh, may last a good portion or all of RSV season. So here at Lurie, this last week and this week, we had to pivot to, with our limited supply, essentially focus on the the, the um, administration of nirsevimab to our higher, highest risk infants. The CDC criteria that I mentioned, the uh, guidance that came out this week, um, suggested that children who can get synergists should get synergists to ease up demand on patients who would need nirsevimab. Um, so that we at least have more nirsevimab freed up for our younger infants. And then and to, to focus on the administration to children less than six months. Here at Lurie, we've decided to prioritize infants less than three months of age for nirsevimab to give as many children syn synergists instead as who are eligible. Uh, and um, and um, for our certain high-risk patients, particularly those who are young, but you know, potentially give them nirsevimab if they're having challenges with ob obtaining synergist insurance approval. So just um, uh, some updates on COVID-19, which I'm sure people are, um, um, you know, have had enough of the pandemic the last three years, but COVID is, uh, is still around. Um, as you had 
you know, this is data from the Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, we had seen an increase in COVID hospitalizations and deaths this fall, a slight increase. Um, um, although that, as you can tell from the ends on the right end of the graph, so that is actually improving slightly now. Um, what's different about this fall is that the COVID-19 vaccine recommendations are simpler. Uh, so there was a, a new um, updated uh, vaccine that came out in September um, where that the designation of being up to date is a lot simpler now. Um, so essentially, if you're um, above five years of age, five to 11 or greater than 12, irrespective of whether you've had um, previous COVID vaccination or not, if you get one Pfizer or one Moderna vaccine, this updated vaccine, you're considered up to date. And they do, they do recommend everyone over five months to get the, uh, over six months to get the updated vaccine. Um, if you choose to get Novavax and you're over 12 years old, it is a two do dose series for this updated vaccine. <clears throat> for the patients who are six to six to four years, it actually is a um, a series that you have to take depending on how many previous doses you had of the previous vaccine. Um, the updated gu guidance from uh, the NIH on treatment recommendations for children for COVID-19, um, all the, uh, are are summarized here. Um, now, their um, designation of primary season up to date is has not been updated because now it's just one dose is considered up to date. Nonetheless, um, uh, patients who are considered monoral immunocompromised children are still considered high risk for COVID. Um, and that unvaccinated children <clears throat> with um, certain conditions listed, listed in the, the box there, um, significant obesity, medical complexity, and a severe asthma, cardiac disease, et cetera, are considered high risk if unvaccinated and inter intermediate risk if vaccinated. Uh, and the other conditions are considered uh, intermediate risk there on the bottom, including young age, sickle cell disease, and poorly controlled diabetes. So we get a lot of questions of like what what treatment options are available for COVID. You know, as you remember in the previous couple of years, there were monoclonal antibodies that we had, which unfortunately there are none right now that are effective against existing variants. Um, so our our main uh, treatment in the outpatient setting for uh, children uh, above twelve is Paxlovid, um, and that there is also the option of remdesivir. Um, which is an intravenous medication which we can give to certain children who are high risk if they cannot take Paxlovid um, because of drug interactions that are common. For under 12 years of age, if you're high risk, um, we don't have um, Paxlovid yet approved, um, uh, but we do have clinical trials at Lurie where children open label so you would not be randomized to placebo. You could get the medicine that children can be en enrolled in. Uh, however, the recommendation for the use of that is still, um, um, we're not really sure if there's against or for it for under 12 years, even for high-risk patients. And for intermediate risk patients, what, regardless of the age, um, the there isn't recommendation, the evidence to suggest for or against the use of any antiviral therapy. Um, and so we, at Lurie, decided on a case-by-case -case basis, but de depending on their individual risk factors. And for low risk patients, it's just supportive care. I want to thank you for the opportunity to give this update and I'm uh, willing to answer any questions. This is great, thank you so much. A uh, lot of really important uh, information that you provided us. And uh, there's some questions that, are, that have come in. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a look what we have here. Uh, Dr. Sunderbrook writes, if someone already got the flu vaccine, how soon can they get the COVID booster if they didn't get it at the same time? Uh, you can, you can um, get it at like whenever is the patient would would like to. Like there isn't a reason to delay it. So. Okay, great. And then, can you mix COVID vaccines in children? I thought new guideline states okay to do so. Um. So the 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 recommendation now, if you're um, the they prefer you to 
complete the, the um, original series, but you can switch. However, the amount of doses will be different. So that so that 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 would complicate it. So it's easier best to stay with the original regimen because there's um there's a difference between Pfizer and Moderna. Okay. That's great. Thank you for that. Um we already did our questions. <laughs> so um I'd like to thank you again for joining us today. Um this is again really important information. If someone wanted to get a hold of you or talk to you further, uh where where are the best ways to uh, reach you, Dr. Patel? Um my <clears throat> you can uh, email uh, me at sjpatel at lurichildrens.org or um, you can call our um, infectious disease office at 312-227-4080. Uh, great. Great. Thank you so much. And um, well, it looks like one more question came in. Um, I'm going to try to get to that real quick. If a baby has had RSV this season, should they still get a uh, biofortis or what about a young baby with recent exposure, but no illness? So prior to the shortage, um, the recommendation was that irrespective of whether you had R if you had RSV that you would give, um, you could give biofortis. Uh, the, the idea that um, even though the risk of severe RSV disease is, lower once you have RSV, it's not zero, and the, the benefit of giving Bayfortis is still there. The CDC has not recommended um, what to do in our shortage situation for children who've had RSV. Um, I, in in terms of rationing, you know, I, I would I would probably argue that if there's a limited amount of doses, that it's best to give it to children who are young who have not had RSV, because I think that's the, the best way to produce reduce the risk of system-wide of severe RSV disease. But um, but at a medical level, like the, in, in terms of like at an individual patient level, if there wasn't a shortage, you can give Bayfortis to infants who had RSV that season. Uh, and and the, 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 there isn't a role of this, um, if you're exposed to it, um, it is a passive vaccine. Uh, sorry, it's a passive monoclonal antibody. So it, in, it may have some protection um, because um, it's not like a vaccine that needs time for immune system to mount a response. But although we don't know exactly, it hasn't been studied in the sense of like immediate exposure, what the what the benefit is of um, of giving the the vaccine, uh, giving the monoclonal antibody. Okay. After the presentation, we're recording this presentation. Um, so we'll be sending this presentation out to everybody who's not only attending, but who couldn't join us. So um, they will, you'll, you'll see the answer, you'll hear the, and see the answers to these questions along with your slides. So just so you know, um, people will be seeing the slides over. And again, they may still have questions for you that they may be reaching out to you. Okay. So thank you again for joining us and um, we'll talk to you soon. Have a great right, day. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. So moving right along. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ravi Patel and uh, CJ Lilly of our digital health team. They are going to go ahead and uh, have a great uh, presentation for you. Uh, Julie Kalkbrenner, our liaison, is uh, monitoring the questions as we go along, and um, um, she will be presenting the questions to us, or I will be doing it, um, or, or answering questions for you as we go along. So Dr. Patel, uh, would you like to go ahead and share your screen, and I'll, I'll stop sharing. Uh, yes. CJ, do you want to share your screen? I apologize. No worries. Um, Great, looks good. 
So um, what we wanted to share was uh, an advancement in our self-scheduling opportunities for patients who need referrals to Lurie Children's. Um, we've presented in the past um, to share updates and what we've made uh, progress in and for patients who have MyChart accounts at Lurie Children's or have access to MyChart accounts through any of our uh, CIN partners. So all of that self-scheduling is now also available open um, in open scheduling. So what that means is effectively a patient can now access all of those same decision trees to get to facilitate scheduling to the right, pa uh, the right patient with the right provider at the right time um, in the right uh, clinic setting. And we can do that all through open scheduling. So they can actually just now go to our website to uh, self-schedule without the need for an access to a MyChart account. So patients who are not potentially part of our um, CIN uh, population, or they are part of our CIN network, but don't have a MyChart account with Lurie just yet, this gives them an easier way to access those appointments. Of note, um, and any patients who are looking for those preferred CIN slots, as we're trying to revise and, and optimize those uh, that accessibility for our CIN patients, those CIN slots will still only be available for those who log in through MyChart, so we can verify the patient and, and that they are part of the CIN, which we wouldn't be able to do in open scheduling. So if we flip to the next page. Uh, so what open scheduling is, is this idea that if you start all the way at the bottom, our centralized access center is here. It's a, it, They are available. We can call 1-800-KIDS-DOC at any time and try to um, schedule your appointment. But everything that is available in the centralized access center is also available now in my chart. So patients can now access the exact same trees that a representative is saying, is kind of talking to them uh, about over the phone. They can actually access those same questions in MyChart. There is more benefits uh, for those who log into MyChart because if they've logged into MyChart, they now have the accessibility to those CIN slots, but they also now have uh, the opportunity to not have to type in as much information. The patient is already identified. Their insurance information is already in the system. Um, they don't have to re-enter all of that information. They also have the capabilities of uh, ticket scheduling, which is the ability for as soon as you put in your RFS, it will actually automatically send a text message, email, and a ticket within their MyChart account to let them know that this, this uh, referral has been placed. They can just click on a button, answer a few questions, and then schedule their appointment. In the case that they don't have a MyChart account, they can do what is what we'll go through is open scheduling. They can actually just go to our website, click on a link, um, and sc uh, schedule an appointment. This is only meant to be scheduled for patients who are looking for new patient appointments or new referrals. Um, and this is something that's available while they're sitting in your clinic. So if your clinic staff want to facilitate it and assist them, they can. If patients want to do it while they're waiting for their ABS, um, they can actually just pull up their phone and, and, and click on, go to learningchildrens.org and we'll walk through the workflow in a second, um, but they can actually just schedule their own appointment. So here you'll see this available um, on our web version uh, from a computer, whether a laptop or a desktop, but the same uh, opportunity is available on a mobile device um, in a very similar um, formatting. They can actually just go to our Lurie Children's homepage, click on make an appointment. And when they do that, they'll see that top left screen choosing between new and existing patients. If they're an existing patient and have a MyChart account, again, we want to recommend that they log into their MyChart account. They get access to those preferred slots. They don't have to enter as much information. Um, if they are a new patient and uh, don't have a MyChart account, they can just select from that drop down menu which specialty they're trying to schedule for, hit continue, and then it'll take them into their decision trees in that second bo box. They'll pick, answer a few questions, and then the uh, screenshot on the far right will then come up, which will give all of the appointments that are available uh, for scheduling um, immediately. These are the exact same appointments that are available through the Centralized Access Center as well. So there's no differentiation of if they call in versus go to our website and whether or not they'll see different appointments. Um, if this is not in the appropriate time frame, there's always the opportunity to escalate between the referring provider and our specialties to see if uh, either some double booking or overbooking can occur to facilitate that consult. We flip to the next page. You'll see here, this is the opportunity for a patient to schedule uh, as a guest. So if they don't have a MyChart account, they can then put in a quick comment as to what they want to have addressed during this appointment, click schedule as a guest, enter all of their information, and now that we'll have created their chart in the Lurie system. If they enter this information and they've 
previously been seen but by Adlery or already have a chart, it will automatically merge those charts. Um, so you don't have to worry about duplicate charts for, for the patients. It'll uh, match name, date of birth, and zip code to, to merge those charts. Um, and otherwise, if they look like similar charts, our HIM team actually reviews them on a daily basis and ensures that we don't have duplication occur. On the alternative, we flip, flip to the next page, is if they happen to have a MyChart account but just didn't want to log in right at the beginning, they can still access all of those same questions, schedule an appointment, and then log in. And if they click on Log In and Schedule, they'll pick their the patient they're scheduling for, and then they don't have to enter any of that information that we had on the previous page. All of that information will pull through, including their insurance information, and then they'll get scheduled into their appointment. Caveat here is even if they do this, They've already picked the appointment date and time, so those preferred appointment dates and times won't won't be visible um, to them at, at, if they go through the open scheduling process. Let me flip one more page. As far as the provider experience, no changes. Um, our ask is that you continue with submitting the referrals. Um, there's two main reasons for this. One is that if you, once you submit the referral, that helps us with ensuring that the whatever insurance. Uh, pre-authorizations that may be necessary are completed uh, uh, and so that there's not any delay in care. And then secondarily, this also helps us ensure that patient who may, let's say, schedule through open scheduling, then decides to cancel that appointment, that referral will stay open and that, that then prompts us to then reach back out to the patient and make sure that the referral is completed um, if the referral is still open and it's not, the order has not been canceled. And then as far as uh, sharing, um, you can share this link, just it's our lurychildrens.org uh, website link. So you can share this with any of um, the staff within your clinics uh, to streamline some of the referral process. If you have any other questions, you can always reach out to our team. I think we have one more slide after this. I think, or just questions is all we have. So um, I hand it back over to you, Chad. Great, great. So um, really appreciate this, you coming on. I know there's, um, right now I don't have any questions in the chat room with it, about it, but I know there's been uh, a lot of excitement uh, regarding this um, through our meetings and when we visit our clients in, the, in their offices and stuff like that. So um, if questions do come up uh, during, the, during this presentation, uh, we'll be sure to email them over to you Dr. Patel, because um, I know this is super important, especially to our uh, patients who are trying to uh, get a quick get a quick appointment. So, um, but yeah, it looks like I don't have any questions right now in the chat room, the Q and A. So, just want to uh, thank you for joining us today, and um, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right, as we uh, move forward on our symposium here, um, again, I'd like to thank you for joining us and uh, we encourage questions um, in the chat room or raise your hand or in the Q&A room and we will get to them. So moving on, we are really excited to share that as September 1st, Larry Children's has partnered with PM Pediatric Urgent Care Centers to provide pediatric urgent care services. You know, as, as Dr. Patel touched on earlier, um, there was the trifecta virus surge of 2023, and nobody really was affected more by it um, than you, our pediatric partners in the community, and our and our ER. So and it became apparent that Larry Children's needs to do more to work our, work with you, the community provider, and families with pediatric patients in our area. So we are pleased to be offering the support service for our area pediatricians and our ERs. Our relationship with PM Pediatrics offers us the ability to serve more children with high quality urgent care throughout the Chicago area. Both PMP and Lurie Children are committed to the highest quality urgent care. PMP operates over 100 pediatric urgent care facilities across the country with a singular focus, delivering quality urgent care for children and adolescents. The often collaborate with pediatric academic medical centers in the region, in other regions such as Boston Children's, Lake Forest Health, and numerous other children's healthcare facilities to deliver quality care affiliated with local trusted partner. 
P Pediatrics also understands retail urgent care and has a model that builds open clinics in heavy traffic and family friendly, friendly areas. So this joint venture will bring the following. PM Pediatric providers are pediatricians with ED and urgent care experience and advanced practice providers. All staff within PM Pediatrics will be employed by PM Pediatrics and will be following Lurie Children's clinical care guidelines. There are locations in Glenview, Naperville, and Mount Prospect. Appointments can be made by calling PM Pediatric locations or online at pmpediatrics.com. Each PM Pediatric site will house a basic lab and imaging service. Most Lurie insurance plans are accepted. No school or sports physicals at, 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 are at any of the PM Pediatric sites. No immunization, immunizations will be given at any pediat PM Pediatric site. Some prescriptions will be available on site for commonly prescribed pediatric medicines. PM Pediatric does not use Lurie Epic. We are determining the best interface to work between both EMRs. In the meantime, PM Pediatrics will have access to Lurie through Epic Care Link and Lurie Epic. However, with Ambra interface, images can be shared between PM Pediatrics and Lurie Children's. PCP follow-up communication will take place after each patient encounter. Some of you have already experienced their physician follow-up communication. Streamlined Lurie specialty care appointments for follow-up is in process. The goal is to assist families with pediatric specialty care to Lurie children's specialists should it be needed after an urgent care visit. Want to point out that Lurie children's in Northbrook, our immediate care in Northbrook will be closing on November 6 and referring all patients, urgent care patients to PM Pediatrics in Glenview. Future PM Pediatric locations are to be determined over the coming years. So right now we don't know those sites, but uh, once we do, of course, we will announce them. We are super excited to announce that late 2025 at 1994 Roselle Road in Schaumburg, we will have our new Schaumburg Outpatient Center. This will be a 70,000 square foot outpatient center that will house 40 exam and treatment rooms for pediatric specialty care, diagnostic imaging and cardiac testing. It will also offer clinical services like ambulatory infusion, a blood bank, and pharmacy. As you see here on your screen, we have a multitude of subspecialty services offered, and as well as ancillary services offered. So, um, like I said, super excited about this. In late 2025, when it opens, we will transition both the Arlington Heights Outpatient Center as well as the Huntley Outpatient Center. Um, all those subspecialty services will be transitioned over to Schomburg. So you have all heard me talk a lot already. So I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Paula Nowak, who is gonna talk about our new GI providers and programs. Paula, take it away. Yeah, we have two new GIs. One, Corey Klepper, is Director of Nutrition and Support Program. She has clinics uh, at the main campus in Lincoln Park in Northbrook. And Dr. Sherry Tam, Director of Quality Improvement for GI, has clinics in Glenview. And in addition to the two new GI providers, we have a few uh, very nice additions to our programs. Uh, the first one is IB STEM, and that treats symptoms for irritable bowel syndrome using electrical nerve stimulation. So it stimulates both the amygdala and the vagal nerve at the uh, simultaneously. 
Uh, at Lurie, we started this in March of 23, so earlier this year, and we're using it for patients 11 to 18. Uh, the device is very similar to a hearing aid. It's non-invasive and worn uh, right behind the ear. Uh, Dr. Joshua Projelek is the clinical leader of the program, and we're currently scheduling for IB STEM into 2024. Uh, the second program is a kind of a subset of our neurointestinal program for chronic abdominal pain. Uh, it treats really chronic abdominal pain of, in all forms, uh, but focuses on pain predominant disorders of gut brain interaction and abdominal pain and it is an interdisciplinary uh, program that can confirm diagnosis, develop new diagnosis, and follow up. And the third program, which will be going live in 2024, is the Fecal Mibrobiota Transplantation Program. So stool from a healthy donor is used to correct dysbiosis that predisposes patients to C. diff and it's an alternative to antibiotic therapy. So again, nice additions to our GI program. So have some additional specialists and surgeons. We will be following up by sending out some additional information on each of these specialists. But as you can see, many of them are in areas where we have wanted to improve our access. Genetics, neurology, developmental pediatrics, endocrinology, um, et cetera. So more to come on these new specialists. And Paula, we, we, uh, we can note that um, if they'd like to meet one of those new specialists, we can set up a, a virtual meeting with them. Yes, right. always happy. Just contact your liaison, and we would be happy to arrange uh, an introduction or, uh, introductory virtual meeting with any of these specialists that, at a time that works for you. That's right. As we know, a lot of people are interested in some of this, some of these, such as like genetics and neurology, right? Yes. And um, also, I want to point out, Paula, is that after the first of the year, um, we will be sending an email promotion that you'll be able to see full bios of all of our new specialists that have joined Lurie within the last year. So excited yeah. to say that as well. Including videos and um, more information about their training and background. Yeah, absolutely. So we would also like to remind everybody that our friends at Pediatrust, we have partnered with them to put on a wonderful CME uh, in memory of Dr. Ruben Rokoba. Many of you knew Dr. Rokoba. He was such a, such a wonderful, wonderful man. He took special interest in med medically complex children. He loved teaching residents and medical students over at Wheaton Pediatrics. And he was a wonderful and talented medical writer. Um, so we are pleased to honor his memory with this seminar. It is a free seminar. It's in person only. Uh, snacks and lunch and continental breakfast will be served. Like I said, this is a free service. It'll be held in person in Northbrook on November 10th, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Pediatrust's new facility, corporate office at 2375 Water, Waterview Drive in Northbrook. And they're going to have three sessions with Dr. Dr. Lewis first, Dr. Robert Listernick, and uh, Dr. Jenny Radetsky. If you are interested and you do not have the link to this, please reach out to your liaison. We'll be happy to send that link over to you and uh, help you register. Speaking of events, our team's annual pediatric coding seminar that our good friend Julie Kochbrenner hosts and puts on every year uh, we like to see you save the date. It's going to be Friday, March 1st in Oak Brook. We do not have the location yet, but we do have our presenter. Her name is Linda Parsi, and she was here last year. We had such wonderful feedback on Dr. From Dr. Par about Dr. Parsi from all of you. So I hope uh, once we have the location set and our registration is all set up, 
that you plan on joining us. So please mark your calendars for Friday, March 1st. I'd like to remind you all that our physician services webpage is here for you. We have all of the updated information about our upset up patient centers, our subspecialist schedules. There's such so many contact resources there for you, such as our quick reference phone and fax number, our specialist referral guide that you get that we the nice little book that we send you every year. By the way, sidebar. If you still need your specialist referral guide, please let your liaison know. We'd be happy to bring those to you in person. But on our website, we also have our services by location. We have videos of all of our great roundtables. So please bookmark in your browser, lurychildrens.org slash physician services, and it'll help you get all of the updated referral information that you need for Lurie Children's. I'd like to remind you to follow us on social media, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or go to our YouTube page and see all of our symposiums, roundtables, virtual meetings. They are here for you, as well as some video bios of some of our specialists. Now I'd like to invite you to stay with us and engage in some dialogue with us. Uh, do you have about questions? Um, and right now I see some questions in the Q&A and I am going to, is there a link or contact for abdominal pain clinic? That is not up and running yet, but once we do, I promise to share it with you. Um, you should have, recently received an email from us uh, regarding the GI services and profiles. It has links if they're available to the web pages and also has a wonderful video presentation on there for you. So that is all available for you as well. So um, I do not see any other questions or messages in the chat room. So. Um, I just, oh, one more just popped up here. Can you share that last website again? Sure, that is. I'll, I'll just go ahead and put the screen up for you. There it is. That is lurychildrens.org slash physician services. And like I said, bookmark that and we'll get that up and running. Uh, you can see all the great information that we have. And you're welcome. So I think that is it for now. Um, again, we have recorded this session. We will be emailing it out to you. Please share it with your colleagues, um, your referral coordinators, your practice managers. Um, this a lot of vital information there for you. Um, and as always, uh, reach out to me, Chad Worley, Paula Nowak, or Julie Kalkbrenner. Yeah, uh, and we are all here to help you. So with that, you guys have a wonderful day and we'll be seeing you all soon. Bye-bye now.